with Phil Scraton, who is a criminology professor in Belfast. He's also been on the Hillsborough Independent Research Panel for over 20 years, researching the Hillsborough case. Thank you for being with us here today. It's a pleasure. Um, would you mind explaining very briefly for our audience what was the Hillsborough disaster? Well, what happened was that on the 15th of April, 1989, Liverpool were playing in a, a, a football match against Nottingham Forest. It was at a neutral ground in Sheffield called Hillsborough. And it was a major game. They played the previous year the same match the same, against the same team in the semi-final of the FA Cup. It's one of the biggest matches in the season, in the football season in England. And uh, a lot of fans arrived at the ground and it's an old ground, it dates back to the late 19th century and that end of the ground where Liverpool fans were going in uh, had been uh, a problem for many years. It was a, a bottleneck and 27,000 people had to get through uh, approximately 30 turnstiles into the ground and it was always a problem. And this particular year some of the turnstiles weren't working, there, were no, there, was, there, was, there was no channeling of the fans and the consequence was a major crush built up outside the turnstiles and it looked as though people were going to be crushed to death. The police took uh, 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 action which was to open an exit gate and to allow people off the back of that crush into the stadium through the exit gate. But they didn't police them onto the terraces and the problem with that was they went down a one in six gradient tunnel into the back of two pens, like cattle pens, that were already full. And when they got into the pens, they couldn't get back out of the tunnel, they couldn't move sideways because there were fences, and they couldn't move forward because there was a perimeter fence in front of the, of, of the pens that they were in. They were trapped. But more people came down not knowing, because they weren't being stewarded, so they didn't know that the pens were already full till they got to the bottom of the tunnel. By then it was too late. There was real compression on the, uh, on the terrace and it, it was like a vice. One of the, one of the men who survived, uh, uh, Eddie Spirit, whose son died, he said it was like a vice getting tighter and tighter. And what happened at that moment was a barrier collapsed. 96 people died. They couldn't get them out. Um, and there was an inadequate response by the police, an inadequate response by the ambulance service. They couldn't get them out. 400 people were, were, were seriously injured and thousands were traumatised. That was the essence of the disaster itself. And then you became very connected with the research about the case afterwards. How did you become connected with it? Well, I'm from Liverpool and I'm also a Liverpool supporter. I'd been to many matches and I'd seen the way in which fans were treated. They were treated like cattle. I mean, we were going on to standing terraces that were old and decrepit. Uh, I knew that and uh, I, I was in Liverpool with uh, my family when it, when it happened and it was only the second semi-final I'd not been to. And when, uh, when, when, when I realised what was unfolding, I had a visual picture of exactly what was happening. And I went to Liverpool City Council and I said, look, this has got to be investigated and researched properly and thoroughly, but also, most importantly, independently. We can't leave this to the police or to the authorities because they were implicated. So uh, what we did was that we set up the Hillsborough Project and we produced our first research report a year later. Uh, and we've produced our second research report in 1995. Uh, it wasn't having an impact, so eventually I decided I was going to write Hillsborough the Truth, the book. Mm -hmm. And I did that in 1999. So the biggest challenge for you in this project then would have been how you weren't making any ground and the police would always sort of say it wasn't true? I think the hardest thing for me to come to terms with, and I think for the general public, was that we realised that the evidence had been corrupted and I managed to get the police statements, uh, I got access to the police statements in the late 1990s. And what we found was that there was a wholesale review and alteration of the police statements to fit uh, a narrative, a story that would suit the actual police version of events. So not only were the police responsible, but then they were part of what, I can only use the phrase cover up. Yep. And they covered up their own tracks, they, others covered up their tracks as well. And the consequence of that was that the, the case, which at that time was the longest inquest in British legal history, it, it never really came into the, public, into the public view in terms of who was really responsible. 
And of course, the myth of Hillsborough was that the fans were responsible, that hooliganism was responsible. Yeah. And that myth fed onto the Liverpool city, it fed onto Liverpool fans, and it became the reality, if you like, in the general public discourse. And that's what we had to challenge. They've now said that it was at the fault of the police and other organisations that were involved. Yes. But specifically, the chief superintendent, Dave Duckenfield, yes. has been named as one of the chief people responsible. Yes. Do you agree with this? Well, there's no question that his policing was completely inadequate. He'd only been in office, he'd only been the, the senior officer involved at Hillsborough um, at that point for three, three previous football matches. Mm -hmm. So he was inexperienced and they expected the team around him to support him. But also David Duckenfield uh, was very arrogant and he wouldn't take instructions from others. On the day of the disaster he went missing between 11 o'clock in the morning and 2 o'clock in the afternoon. So he was nowhere to be found during that time. Then when the disaster unfolded he hadn't got the experience to be able to manage it, to manage the situation. So whilst I do believe that David Duckenfield has a major case to answer and in fact he was already prosecuted once for manslaughter and it was a hung jury so there was no verdict. Um, while he has a case to answer, and there's no question about that and we've been very clear about that in all our findings. There were other authorities that also had a case to answer. The ambulance service who didn't re respond sufficiently quickly, the club whose ground was in inadequate, the local authority who supposedly issued a, a safety certificate for the ground and there was no safety certificate. So all of these authorities had a case to answer as well as other senior police officers. Uh, but David Duckenfield himself also quite clearly uh, was responsible for many of the decisions that went wrong on the day. As of December 12th, the Hillsborough case has been passed to the Crown Prosecution Service. What does this mean for all your work? Well, where we are at the moment is that we have three strands left. We've had one already, which is obviously the inquest, and that was groundbreaking. Now we have the possible criminal prosecutions. At the moment, there's a recommendation of 15 people to be possibly mm -hmm. prosecuted, um, but there might be more. We also have the Independent Police Complaints Commission and they have a very serious, uh, they, they have very serious job to do on the liability of the police officers at, at that level. And then finally, um, we have the possibility of the civil case where the um, families will be taking a, a class action. So there are still three elements to go and I will be involved with the legal teams at all of those levels. Do you think that the police force in the UK would cover up something like this again or would, have they changed their attitude since the Hillsborough case? I, I think we have to keep an open mind on how those in authority act when they are culpable of serious deficiencies. That could be medical staff in hospitals, it could be the military uh, and quite clearly it can be police officers. In some of my other work, for example, on imprisonment, uh, I, I deal all the time with the responsibility of prison officers and prison governors for what goes on in their prison. I think when those in authority find themselves actually accused of very serious, what, what can only, we can only describe as crimes, they might describe them as misdemeanors, but when they are, are, are in those situations where quite clearly there are serious deficiencies, there is always the possibility that they will cover their tracks, that they will attempt to um, place the blame and responsibility elsewhere. There's a, a phrase that was used in one of the books by um, a, a guy called Professor Morton who wrote a book on policing many years ago. And one of the things he said is there are two forms of corruption. The first form is to be bent for yourself, meaning corrupt for yourself, mm -hmm. that you make a, a, a personal gain. And then he said there's a, the, the other form, which I find more interesting, is being bent for the job. And by that what he meant was corrupt for the job, where you're protecting your own interests, where you're protecting the police interests or the prison interests or the school interests, but you're doing that in order to cover your tracks so that the institution itself will not be held responsible. Now, to move slightly on to another subject, you recently were nominated for an OBE in the Queen's Honours of 2016, and you turned it down. It's yes. not something many people do. Why well, did you do it? yes, there, there are very few people who turn it down. I mean, I'm, I'm apparently in very, very good company, and um, 
the, the, the recent death of David Bowie, for example, is, 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 one, is one example. Uh, I, I turned it down for two reasons. One, because I do my job. I'm an academic, I'm a researcher, I'm a writer, and I'm a teacher. And I, I don't do my job to gain national awards given to me by the monarch um, for services to, to, to the country. Um, they, I do my job in order to get to the truth. Um, I have been given uh, an honorary doctorate uh, in laws from my old university, Liverpool, um, and I've also uh, been awarded the freedom of the city of Liverpool, which is very unusual. But they came from the people or they came from my peers. I don't want an honour that comes through uh, some out-of-date notion of a British empire. That's another element as well. So the first element is that I don't do it for, I, I don't do my work in order to gain honours. I do my work in order to get to the truth, in order to do the, uh, a good job in that sense. Mm -hmm. But the other issue is that I would find it very difficult to accept any honour from a state where the honour is actually the order of the British Empire. There is no British Empire. I don't agree with British imperialism. I don't agree with what was done under the name of British imperialism. Therefore, it would be completely uh, contradictory in my, my, in, in, in my own head to kneel before a monarch and to accept uh, a, a, an award on, on behalf of the British Empire. So that would be the second, the, the second reason. Uh, and I went public about it because I knew that they were going to break the story. But I wanted to make a statement and say, look, we've got to think again about how we honour people for doing good work in our society. So ideally, what do you see happening next? Well, what I hope is going to happen is that, we, that, that, that the due process of the law takes its course. What we have to remember is a lot of the people involved at Hillsborough, including many of the families, sadly, and many of the survivors, have since died. But a lot of the key players at Hillsborough, a lot of the police officers and those in authority, have also died. We also have a real difficulty of getting the cases through the criminal courts because we have to go through the courts beyond reasonable doubt. That, that is the test in the courts. And one of the problems about saying beyond reasonable doubt is people's memories over 27 years are blurred. They're blurred by reading my book, by watching television programs, by watching the, the Hillsborough film. So if they come to court to give evidence, the first thing that uh, the defense witnesses, the defense um, barrister is going to say to them is, you know, well, have you seen this film? Have you read this book? How do we know that your mind and your judgment isn't infected by that? So to get a beyond reasonable doubt verdict in the criminal court is going to be difficult. There will be prosecutions, and some of those prosecutions won't relate just to the disaster, but what happened afterwards, including perjury. Um, so I think the due process of the law is one issue. I think the findings of the Independent Police Complaints Commission should, I'm not saying they will, but they should, uh, clearly establish where the blame and responsibility lay with the police. And then finally, the class actions in the court. The families are not taking these actions to gain money. They're taking it to have recognized in a civil court, which is not beyond reasonable doubt, but on the balance of probabilities, to have it established in another court of law the actual responsibility of the authorities. So that's how I see it going. Can I predict it? No, I would never, I would never try and predict it. But I certainly would hope that the families would gain some solace from the fact that the prosecutions, um, the, the prosecutions actually operated appropriately. But you can never bring 96 people back. There can be no closure for Hillsborough for the families. The families will continue to suffer their loss. And myself and my researchers and those, my family, those around me will continue to support those families for as long as we can. This is a fight you've been fighting for 27 years, and it's incredible how dedicated you and your team have been to this. What would you say for people who also want to fight for causes like that? What I say to my students who are setting out on doing human rights and social justice work is you're in it for the long haul. You don't take this on lightly. You don't say, oh, I have a project, and my project finishes in three years, and I'm sorry I can't help you after that. I, I, I believe fundamentally that if you engage in a project around civil liberties, human rights, social justice, you have to see it through to the end. Now, no one would have predicted it would be 27 years. My son, our oldest son, he was, he was 10 at the time of Hillsborough. 
his daughter is now 10 years old. That, that gives you my, life, my lifespan. Uh, and I think the other issue is to try and gain a balance when you're doing that work between the work you do, your family life, um, and, and indeed your other work, because my other work is on prisons, on deaths in custody, other controversial cases. Uh, but I, I think the issue really fundamentally is that if you undertake to do this kind of work with families who've been bereaved or with survivors or any of the kind of social justice issues, you can't say, I'm only doing this for a set amount of time. Uh, I think this is my own personal position. I think you have to see it through to the end, whatever that is. Thank you very much for speaking to us, Mr. Scruton. It's a pleasure. Thank you.